Hello, my precious friends. I really hope that you are doing great. Welcome to our today's class. It is our fifth lesson on the third topic of Form 4, which is called Floating and Sinking. As usual, let me commence by giving the quote of the day, which states that remembering that someone's success depends on your efforts is the greatest intrinsic motivation one can ever have. So we shall discuss that quote at the end of our class today. So today we are looking at further examples involving the law of rotation and the Ahmed's principle. So our first example reads that the diagram below shows a block of wood of dimension 0.3 by 0.3 by 0.2. So this one simply means that uh, the length of the block of wood is 0.3 meters, the width is 0.3, then the height is 0.2 meters, of course, as shown in this particular diagram. Length is 0.3, width 0.3, then the height is 0.2 meters. Then we are told that floating to a depth of 0.18 meters in water. So that simply means that the only height or the only depth of that particular block of wood that is submerged in water is 0.18 meters. That is as shown in this particular diagram. So part A, we are told to determine, uh, Roman 1, the mass of the wood. So we have two ways in which we can find the mass. So mass can be given by density times volume. But because from this particular question we are not provided with the density of the block of wood, that simply means that the formula for mass is equal to density times volume will not help us to achieve our objective. Therefore, because we are told that the body is floating, the easiest way of finding the mass is first of all finding the weight of that particular block of wood. Then because we are told that the body is floating, then from the law of flotation, which stated that a floating body displaces its own weight of the fluid in which it floats. Then we established that uh, from the law of flotation that uh, the weight of the floating body must be equal to the weight of the fluid that that particular body displaces. In this case, the body that is floating is actually the block of wood. Then the fluid being displaced, of course, is water. Therefore, the weight of the wood will be given by uh, will be equal to the weight of the water that it will displace, courtesy of the uh, the law of flotation. So remember, if we find the weight, we know that weight is mass times gravity. So if we find the weight, we'll be in a position to find the mass of the wood. So weight of the wood is equal to weight of the water displaced, which is equal to rho Vg. So density of the water displaced times, times volume of water displaced times gravity, which is equal to density of the water displaced multiplied by, we know that the volume of uh, a cuboid is given by length times width times height. Then of course, multiplied by gravity. So this will be equal to the density of the water displaced is 1000 multiplied by the length. The length of course is 0 0.3, then the width is 0 0.3 meters. Then the height of the water displaced. So we use the height of the water displaced because here we are finding the volume of the water displaced. So we are told that it is floating to a depth of 0 0.18 meters. So the height of the water displaced is actually 0 0.18 meters and not the 0 0.2 meters. You can see some parts that is of the 0 0.2 meters are outside the fluid. But here we are talking of the weight of the water displaced. Therefore, we must also use the volume of the water that has been displaced. Then we know that the volume of the water displaced will simply be equal to the volume of the block of wood that is submerged in water. Therefore, the height that is submerged in water is 0 0.18 meters. Therefore, uh, the volume of the fluid displaced will be equal to the volume of the block of wood that is submerged in water, which is the cross-sectional area, which is 0 0.3 by 0 0.3, times the height that is submerged in water is 0 0.18 meters remember most students usually confuse they use the 0 0.2 so we can only use 0 0.2 meters when finding the weight of the water displaced if we are told that the whole block of wood is submerged in water but in this case we are told that only 0 0.18 meters of this particular block is submerged in water therefore for the height we just use 0 0.18 meters because that is the only uh, height of the block of wood that is submerged in water so 0 0.18 times 10. So if you compute 1,000 times 0 0.3 by 0 0.3 by 0 0.18 times 10, you'll obtain the weight of the block of wood as 16.2 Newton. Now that we have the weight, we can easily find the mass because we know that weight is equal to mg. So weight of the block of wood is equal to mass of the block of wood times gravity. Therefore, if I make mass of the wood subject of the formula, I simply divide both sides by gravity. So mass of the block of wood is equal to weight of the block of wood over gravity. 
So weight, we have already computed it here, uh, which is equal to 16.2 Newton, which is also equal to the up thruster uh, of that particular uh, water. So the weight is 16.2 Newton divided by gravity is 10 Newton per kilogram, which will give us 1.62 kilograms. So that is the mass of the wood. Then Roman 2, they want us to find the density of the wood. So we know that density is mass over volume. Therefore, density of the wood will be given by mass over, of the wood over volume of the wood. So the mass of the wood, we already have it as 1.62 kg. Over volume of the wood, of course, is length times width times height. So remember, in this case, we are talking of the volume of the whole block of wood. Therefore, we'll use the dimensions of length, width times the whole height of this particular block of wood. So in this case, we are using 0 0.18 because we were interested in the volume of the water that was displaced, which is equals to the volume of the water that was immersed in the fluid, which was only 0 0.18 meters. So in this case, uh, density of the wood is mass of wood over volume of wood. So mass is 1.62. The volume of the wood will use cross-sectional area, which is 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 then times the height of the whole block of wood, which is 0 0.2 meters. So, of course, if you take 0 0.3 by 0 0.3 by 0 0.2, you'll obtain a volume of 0 0.018 cubic meter. So, 1.62 kg by, by 0 0.018 cubic meter, you'll obtain the density of wood as 90 kilogram per cubic meter. Our second example reads that a spherical ball of diameter 0 0.4 meters so if the diameter is 0 0.4, automatically the radius will be half of the diameter, which is 0 0.2 meters. And mass of 20 kg, so the mass is 20 kg, is connected to a rope tied to a seabed so that three quarters of its volume is below the surface. So you can see only three quarters of this particular spherical ball is below the water surface. Therefore, if, when we'll be finding the volume of the fluid displaced, we'll just be using three quarters of its volume so it's below the surface as shown in the figure below assuming that the weight of the rope is negligible calculate the tension in it then you are given we are told to take the density of seawater as 1030 kilogram per cubic meter so again here we'll just find uh, the difference between the upward and the downward forces so remember uh, the tension in this particular rope because the rope is tied at the seabed or at the lower part therefore the tension will act downward because it is trying to prevent this particular uh, uh, spherical ball from being pushed upward by the up thrust force. So of course the only upward force is the up thrust force in this case, then the downward force we shall have the tension in this particular string plus the weight of the spherical ball because we know that weight is mg so it depends on gravity and gravity will always pull objects toward the center of the earth which is the downward direction. So let's start by finding the upward forces which is of course only the up thrust force then we know that up thrust is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. The fluid being displaced in this case is the seawater. Therefore, up thrust is equal to the weight of the seawater displaced. This is courtesy of the Ahmed's principle, which stated that when a body is partially or totally masked in a fluid, it experiences an up thrust equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Therefore, up thrust is just equal to the weight of the seawater displaced which is equal to rho Vg, that is density of seawater displaced times volume of seawater displaced, then times gravity. So which is equal to density of seawater displaced times three quarters. We are told that only three quarters of its volume is below the surface. Therefore, the volume of the fluid displaced will be equal to the volume of the spherical ball that is submerged in water, which is only three quarters of the total volume. Therefore, the volume of seawater displaced will be equal to the volume of the spherical ball that is below the water surface or that is submerged in the water surface, of course, which is three quarters of the total volume of that particular sphere or spherical ball. So we know that volume of a sphere is given by 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Then 3 over 4 of that particular volume is the only one that is submerged in water. So that volume will be equal to the volume of the seawater displaced, that is to cause up thrust. Then of course multiplied by gravity. So the tricky thing here, you need to know that when you are finding the weight of the fluid displaced, we only use the volume of that particular uh, fluid or of that particular body that was submerged in the fluid and not the total volume of the body. However, if the spherical ball was totally immersed in the fluid, then at this particular point, we could have used the total volume of this particular sphere, that is to find the 
uh, weight of the seawater displaced. But because only three quarters of its volume was below the surface of the water, it simply means that three quarters of the volume of the sphere is the one that will be equal to the volume of the displaced water. So that's why I'm taking three quarters of 4 over 3 by r cubed. So density of seawater displaced is 1030. Of course, density of seawater we are given as 1030 kilogram per cubic meter. Then the volume of seawater displaced is three quarters of the total volume. So three quarters of the volume of the spherical ball is 4 over 3 by r cubed. So pi is 3.142. Then the radius is 0 0.2 because the diameter was 0 0.4. So 0 0.2 cubed, of course, in cubic meter. Then multiplied by gravity, which is always 10 newton per kilogram, that is on Earth. So if you take 1030 times 3 over 4 times 4 over 3 times 3.142 times 0 0.2 cubic multiplied by 10, you'll obtain the up thrust, which is equal to the total upward force, which is equal to the weight of the seawater displaced being equal to 258.9008 newton. Then we also find the total downward force. So remember the only downward forces acting is the tension in this particular rope and of course the weight of the spherical uh, ball. So that will be tension of the rope plus uh, the weight of the spherical ball. Remember weight acts downwards. Huh? That is why it is contributing to the downward forces because it depends on gravity and of course gravity will always pull objects towards the center of the earth. So weight of the spherical ball is given by mass times gravity because we are already given the mass of the spherical ball. Then of course gravity is usually 10. So this will be tension of the rope plus uh, 20 kg times gravity, which is 10 newton per kilogram. So 20 multiplied by 10 will obtain uh, 200 newton as the weight of this particular spherical ball. Therefore the total downward force will be tension in the rope plus 200 newton. But because we are told that um, this particular body is actually floating or we can see that it is floating in seawater, then we know that for any floating body, for a floating body, the net force acting on it must be equal to zero. So that simply means that the total upward forces must be equal to the total downward forces. So the upward forces, we had it as 258.9008 Newton, of course, which was only the up thrust force, must be equal to total downward forces is the tension in the rope plus the 200 Newton, uh, which is the weight of the spherical ball. So if I make tension in the rope subject of the formula, I'll take 200 Newton towards the uh, left hand side so that I have tension in the rope being equal to 258.9008 Newton. Then I subtract, uh, I subtract the 200 Newton. So of course, 258.9008 Newton minus 200 Newton, you'll obtain uh, the tension in the rope as being 58.9008 Newton. Lastly, I have an exercise that I recommend you should try at your own free time to gauge the understanding of the concepts that you have just learned. Of course, if you have any challenges in handling any of the questions, feel free to drop a comment specifying the question that you need help in. And as usual, I'm always here to try and help where possible. So we've come to the end of our class today, but we need to discuss the quote of the day. The quote of the day stated that remembering that someone's success depends on your efforts is the greatest intrinsic motivation one can ever have. So the quote is simply uh, applicable to parents, teachers, leaders, and anyone in life who has a responsibility of making someone's life better. And I believe all of us have a responsibility of making someone's life better in our life, whether it is our neighbors, whether it is our young ones, whether they are our age mates. For example, a teacher has a responsibility of guiding learners and showing them the right path to follow in order for them to fully uh, fulfill their potential. Similarly, parents have a responsibility to provide discipline and guide their children in the right direction of life as far as uh, moral, being morally upright is concerned, physical development, psychological development, providing shelter, etc. Similarly, a leader has a responsibility of providing support and vision for his junior. So in short, everybody has a responsibility to improve someone's life. We should therefore do our best to excel in, in the roles in which we have been entrusted by the society. Because the outcomes of our efforts does not just affect us, but rather it also affects everyone and everything around us. Therefore. For any action that you do, just remember it's like um, 
uh, throwing a stone in uh, uh, an ocean, you just don't know the depth to which that particular stone will actually move to. So you don't know the effect of what you are doing in the world. So your small act of kindness or your small uh, positive um, act can actually uh, affect everything in the world positively. So always strive uh, to do your best, strive to do the best with the environment that is around you. And remember, it, you don't have to do something large. You can just do something small, but in a big way. Thank you very much for accompanying me until the end of this particular lesson. I do not take it for granted. In case you are new to the channel, kindly hit the subscription button and also turn on the notification bell so that whenever I upload a new video, you will get notified. If you know any student or anyone that you honestly think could benefit from this content, kindly refer them to Kind Tuition Academy. Until next time, this is Kind Tuition Academy. Thank you very much.